All right, welcome. Everybody get finished getting your treats and drinks and go ahead, take your seat. We're gonna get started. Welcome, welcome to the October RAN meeting. Um, I'm Becky O'Brien, I am the chair of the RAC communication subcommittee that puts on these meetings. Um, and I wanted to just do a quick thank you to the rest of the communication subcommittee. If you'd all stand, maybe a couple, everybody shy. Thank you so much. They all help put all of this on. Um, I wanted to uh, recognize any newcomers. If this is your first meeting, if you would stand. Scott, this is not your first meeting. <laughs> Welcome. Um, and then uh, hi to the remote attendees. Just a reminder, we're doing the live broadcast and this is also being uh, recorded. The video recording will be available sh sometime shortly after the meeting. Um, the uh, a quick reminders, so name tags, you should have on your table uh, name tags. If you go ahead and put your name or where you're from so you can kind of help you get to know your neighbors there. Um, and put uh, your name on the sign-in sheet as well. Let us know who's here, it's very helpful. Um, let's see. Uh, we also have, um, we've talked a couple of times about a survey and we thank everybody who's taken our post-meeting surveys in the past. This time we're gonna do a slight change. So we've been getting a lot of great feedback from everyone, but we feel like we've been hitting you too much with the same questions. So we'd like to rotate it up a little bit. This time we're gonna be sending out a survey just asking about um, topics, suggestions for new meetings. So keep an eye out for that and please share your thoughts with us. We'd really appreciate that. Um, and this is, uh, again, a, a zero waste event. So you'll see the, the um, we actually have a slide for that. Um, uh, you'll see the containers over there for compostable items. So we have uh, the cups, the, the silverware, or silverware, the plasticware, <laughs> the uh, wooden stirrers, those are all compostable. Um, and then anything like sugar packets or um, cups, that sort of thing, that still goes in the trash. Um, and thank you for helping us with that. Um, so I would like to introduce our guest MC for this meeting, David Mulder. He is the, um, the training manager and many of you have seen him in the Navigate Fundamentals class or the Lunch and Learns or the many other trainings that, that he has hosted and organized. Um, so I'll welcome David. Thank you, Becky. I'm very happy to be here. And before I forget, I have been asked to tell everyone who's viewing remotely that we have a couple of handouts that we're gonna be reviewing at today's session and you can access those to download them directly from the viewing page. All right, so when Becky and Constance and the communication subcommittee asked me if I would um, come and MC today, I said, I said, sure, you know, of course, why not? Um, but then I also was thinking back to, it's the October session. I can't remember, Debbie, was it last year? It might have even been two years ago. Was it? It was an October session, though. You might remember that Debbie Talley was the MC, and the theme was research administration horror stories. And that got me thinking about the fact that we have, we have some pretty significant change that's coming down the pike right now. Um, some of those things that we're going to be discussing today. And change for some people can be scary. And so then I thought, well, maybe we should think about things that are actually scary versus some of the changes that we're gonna be talking about today. And so then I started Googling things that are scary. And I would recommend not doing that. <laughs> um, but that said, I'm gonna share a couple with you. Really strange. Um, just teasers, because I didn't, you know, it's, I wanted it to not really cross the line into too bizarre, but you'll get a little taste of. So this is Google's fault. I, I you know, accept no responsibility for this. Um, so things that are not scary, crocheted baby gifts, <laughs> cute and cuddly. Things that are scary, crocheted babies. <laughs> Google it. I was advised it crossed the line. So strange, really disturbing. 
Okay, so that's, that's your first, your first um, foray into things that are actually scary. Not scary. And there's this weird fixation on babies and clowns. I don't know if you've noticed that. So not scary. Toddlers' adult teeth are just above their baby teeth, right underneath their eyes. It makes sense, right? Because, I mean, where else would they come from? Google it. I couldn't even, I couldn't even throw in a teaser on this one, because once you see it, you can't unsee it. Just you take it from me, just Google it yourself. So there are a couple of examples of things to actually potentially be scared of. Things that are not scary. Hiring six new project representatives in ORSP. I know, right? Very good news. Craig is going to be talking about that um, in more detail in just a little bit. But then what is scary is figuring out where in our existing space we're going to put all of these six new project reps. So, you know, some just get a bare light bulb swinging from the ceiling. But um, Also scary, some of you may have seen this, making CN CNN's headline. Yeah, not us, glad to say. What is not scary? making ORSP's deadline. And Craig is going to be filling us in on that in much more detail in just a moment. And before I invite Craig up, I just wanted to leave you with one sort of scary, interesting fact. Did you know that the average new project representative hired into ORSP typically has zero facial features? Consider it. Believe it or not. All right, Craig. It is your turn to provide ORSP updates. Thank you for what I affectionately call a spontaneous round of indifference. <laughs> Just wait a moment. All will be revealed. So um, I always make this mistake of bringing up a drink. Sorry. Thank you. So, uh, zero waste event, that's a high bar. I will do my best not to waste your time. Although I've been in, in plenty of meetings where they either seem to be recycled or should go on the compost heap, but uh, this will not be one of them. Uh, so for the RSP update, I'm gonna spin quickly through this. You're gonna get too much of me over the next 40 minutes, so uh, I'll, I'll try and make this as painless and brief as possible. But first, I want to congratulate some of our staff who have recently been promoted. I don't know if any of them are here. Uh, Joe Johnson, are you here, Joe? He's, he's waving from uh, back in, in uh, Wolverine Tower. Uh, Joe was uh, promoted to project representative, and Cooley Kennedy was promoted to senior project representative and Eric Ward promoted to project rep. So congratulations to all three of them. Six new PRs I'm, with no facial features. See, I didn't know David was gonna say that, but it's, it's true. So um, we just didn't get time to have a professional photographer come out and take pictures, but I would like to welcome uh, the, the six the five new project representatives that are here today. Uh, Christy Bohensky on the government sponsors team and, and Patrick Case, it's Patrick as well, and Becca, Becca Timmermans, all three joining the government sponsors team. And on the private sponsors team, we have Ariel Javarinus on right over here, Ariel. Manny Pierce, also on the private sponsors team. And last but not least, to be de Tamois. Uh, French, I'm not sure exactly what gender, but uh, this individual who is not yet hired will be doing data use agreements. So uh, we just couldn't be happier to have the help and to, and to welcome uh, all five of our new colleagues and one to come and you'll be getting to work with them and meet them um, in the months and years ahead, I hope. So uh, we are just delighted to have them on board. Now, as I said, I wasn't able to get a professional photographer in to get uh, pictures done, uh, portraits, so 
Instead, I, I, uh, I got a group shot uh, of, of them, and I'm, I just, I'm looking forward to all the zany antics that they're going to get involved in, uh, perhaps involving coffee. Um, a few process updates. So if you haven't yet uh, or didn't see them in uh, a rapid, which is a research administration post immediate dispatch for the new folks, um, a couple of process updates. So when it comes to PI signature on an unfunded agreement, we need that PI signature to happen before the UFA, the unfunded agreement, arrives in ORSP, excluding clinical trial NDAs. The same is also true for a PATH, a proposal approval form, if it's for a contract only. So in either the case of a unfunded agreement or a PATH for a contract only, the record, the electronic record, will be returned for the PI signature if it isn't already there at the time that it arrives in ORSP. And the reason we're doing that is because unlike a proposal where we're submitting something to the sponsor for uh, consideration and we'll hear back in nine months whether or not it's been funded, an, an, a contract or an unfunded agreement is a request the moment it hits our doors to start negotiating. And so we want to make sure that the PI has properly disclosed any conflicts of interest and that we're able to know that the, our, our faculty are on board with what's being proposed and that we can confidently move ahead. So this is going to be handled through a, pro, a process where, where the project representative in ORSP will return the PATH or the UFA in those two circumstances. Does that make sense? Okay, well, I can't tell from up here, but. Also, process updates is that prior to beginning its review, ORSP will return any path that has not been finalized. We're laying the groundwork for the deadline policy. So this is, um, as, you, as you'll hear or have, may have heard before, one of the conditions under the deadline policy for ORSP to review a path is that it be finalized. So we're going to start imp enforcing that rule we already actually have. So you'll, you'll be seeing your paths returned uh, in, if, they, if they have not been finalized. And I also want to give a shout out to Kelly Buss, uh, who was the champion within ORSP for the development of a new subrecipient statement of collaborative intent form, the SKI. It's, we are replacing the old letter of commitment that was developed around the time that the financial conflict of interest rules went into effect for PHS. So I don't know how old that form is, but it was due for an update, and we have a brand new spiffy version out on our web. The old letter of commitment form will be phased out in January. Okay, so I'm going to talk about foreign influence, everyone's favorite topic. Um, the last time we met, we went over foreign components and other support and foreign affiliations and how we could apply, comply with the requirements of NIH. So that was back in May. And uh, forget everything I said. It's not quite that bad, but uh, the landscape is shifting. So if, when we met in May, um, at that time, MD Anderson had released a, a couple of faculty for, for um, undisclosed foreign influence. And so the, the landscape was, people were starting to get uh, concerned, and, and those concerns have only been amplified since then. Uh, if, you, if you've been watching the, uh, the headlines, like CNN, uh, we know that Emory uh, also uh, had some faculty who were re released from their appointments due to foreign influence in May. And then in July, um, a email went out to all of the faculty across all three campuses. Uh, that was from the provost and the interim VP for research, Rebecca Cunningham. Uh, setting the tone for the institution, which, is, which was really, um, uh, I think, a, a helpful reminder to everyone. And that message said, in part, international collaborations contribute to academic excellence by advancing research and scholarship across efforts across campus. The members of our community who come here from around the world are integral to this institution's success. 
All of us at the University of Michigan are committed to supporting and fostering these activities with the utmost integrity, transparency, and trust. This commitment includes full compliance with the relevant regulations and guidelines that accompany federal funding. So that's pretty clear. Um, we are, and that hasn't changed at all. But the landscape uh, the, the under which we're trying to navigate compliance has changed uh, pretty significantly. So it, wasn't only, it was a, a day after we met at RAN um, where um, Emory had made headlines about faculty being uh, uh, released, and, and subsequently, uh, we ha NIH released a, a notice. It was 19-114, uh, and you'll see a reference later. It's, it's about other support and, and foreign components, and there were significant changes there in the guidance that I'll, I'll go over. But I, I also want to uh, share with you a more recent uh, email that went out from the president and the provost and uh, the vice, interim vice president for research. And that was last week. How many of you actually saw this email that went out? A few. Um, it went to faculty and grad students and postdocs. And I think it's a really powerful statement that bears uh, quoting from. Uh, in part, they write, Without question, we would not be the leading research university in the United States if, it weren't also, if we weren't also a global university. And that means being open to research collaborations and colleagues, and educational efforts, and partnerships in and from all parts of the world. In other words, we are a global university, and this is inextricably linked to our excellence. When we work and learn alongside researchers from other countries, Cultures demystify, divides are bridged, and we see the commonalities of our shared humanity. This, is the, this makes the world we all share a safer and more prosperous place. And they conclude by saying, and not for a moment are we going to diminish our commitment to being a welcoming place for students and faculty from all around the world, and to engage the ability of our faculty and students to establish collaborations and partnerships with talented, hardworking colleagues in every country Doing so would be counter to our public mission and would diminish our value as a leading American research university. This is a statement that makes me proud to be a member of this community and I, I, I want and I hope that you all will absorb that message as well and, and take it back to, to your home departments and, and really live it um, because it, it is true and it's, and it's critically important to uh, our success. Now, having said that, I want to get into the, the specifics ab about what NIH uh, has, has recently done, recently since May, that is. The NIH issued some recommendations from its advisory group uh, with rec on, on how universities and NIH might counter foreign influence on research. And we're seeing increased scrutiny of foreign collaborations. And this is important, regardless of whether NIH funds are spent by the foreign collaborator. If you recall, that's, all, that's what foreign components are about, in part. So NIH issued a notice, that, that was the 19-114, a reminder of policies and of other support, financial conflicts of interest, and foreign components. And they also published an accompanying FAQ. Now, NIH says that these are clarifications. Um, one might challenge that statement. So for example, if you read the grants policy statement, which I know all of you have, um, the definition of other support is all financial resources, federal, non-federal, commercial, or institutional, available in direct support of an individual's research endeavors. So we've always thought of that as financial meaning grants and contracts, in direct support meaning that our faculty are participating in. Well, if you look at the notice as it, and how it defines other support now, you'll, you may notice that financial resources is gone from the definition. It's all resources, not just financial resources. And I've confirmed that NIH means non-monetary resources, so it's not just grant, grants and contracts anymore. It's all resources, and it's just not uh, resources that are in direct support 
for faculty members research, but are related to that faculty member. So what used to be grants and contracts that a faculty member participates in to uh, all resources, whether non monetary or non-monetary, that are related to your faculty. And it doesn't matter who gave the money or gave the resource or who is the recipient. So this is a, a, a significant expansion of the definition of other support. And we don't yet really know what that means for how we report it yet. Uh, we know we're supposed to report it, we just don't know how. So examples of other support. Grants to U of M from a foreign source, well that's easy. Grants to a foreign entity from a foreign source that benefit our faculty. So follow the money there. Um, you, our faculty have a postdoc in their lab and that postdoc is um, being supported by a foreign government's grant program. No money comes to the university but that is considered other support because our faculty benefit from that non-monetary resource. Um, provision of materials that are not freely available. So think, think about proprietary compounds, biologics, chemicals, and the like. When you start thinking about all of the examples of what goes into this new definition of other support, it really um, is quite daunting to think about how we're going to get it all into one form. But I understand that NIH is actually updating the other support form. Other uh, examples of other support, positions and appointments, both domestic and foreign, held by senior key personnel that are relevant to the application. So a faculty member has an honorary professorship at the uh, University of Kent. That's other support. Affiliations with foreign entities or governments, uh, participation in foreign government talent programs. These, and it doesn't matter whether or not they're paid. So this is, um, this is what the notice says. There will be more information coming out um, through some town hall meetings where as we learn more about what NIH means, um, that we will uh, certainly share it all with you and the faculty as well. And hopefully uh, some more guidance will come out from NIH that clarifies and gives us better instruction on how to comply. So. The other piece uh, that they addressed is the foreign components question. And there is that FAQ deals with a few examples of what constitutes a foreign component and what doesn't. The definition hasn't really changed, but one thing that I have discovered in talking with faculty who have uh, legitimate concerns is that the a real scenario has come up where a, a postdoc in a faculty member's lab who is from another country, does their research with our PI, they publish together, that postdoc then leaves the lab and goes to another country and continues to collaborate, finish writing publications, doing experiments and the like, that suddenly that relationship, which was once okay, is now a foreign component that requires NIH's prior approval, okay? So think departing students, departing faculty, where are they going and do I need to get NIH prior approval to continue that collaboration? Um, perhaps an un unintended consequence. So uh, what can you do? Um, read the notice in the FAQ. There's a website. Um, is it Umore or Oris Pete? Lori, I can't remember which. Uh, It's, so you more, you more. U of M Office of Research is hosting a website where there is additional guidance, and there's a uh, there's a international research activity guidance document which runs through a lot of the different scenarios that our our faculty um, might encounter, and so I would encourage you to to do all of that. But here's what I really want to do: is I want to challenge you. I want you to rise to this occasion. Because we know that research is necessary and that research collaboration is even more necessary and it results in even better science. But I'm hearing from faculty that they are stopping their international, their global collaborations because it's too hard. It's too burdensome to comply. They say, well, if that's what I have to do to be compliant, I'm just not going to do it. 
And I hear other faculty who are fearful that they are being targeted for doing science while Asian, for example. These fears are real. Uh, our faculty, I have heard, are frequently detained as they try to re-enter the country and questioned. Um, but this is the opportunity where we can stand up as research administrators and step into that void and I think um, play a really critical role. This is our chance to be heroic, if you will. Um, we, this is our opportunity to both honor our obligations to the sponsor for full and open transparency, but at the same time, defend our values that the president and the provost and the vice president uh, wrote so eloquently about. So how do we do that? How do we help our faculty and defend our values? Well, learn the rules and explain those rules to our faculty and then make the rules easy for them to follow. It's our job to ease their burden so that they can really do the most world-changing uh, research that they can possibly do with whomever they need to collaborate with across the globe. So if we can be of service and we can take ownership of the heavy lifting for compliance, our faculty will continue to find global collaboration that's worth the effort because it's our job to ease their burdens. And secondly, I'd say, be a friend to anyone in this community who feels like they're being persecuted for no other reason than they were born in a different country. Show them some kindness, show them some understanding and care and ease their burdens too. Don't let anyone diminish our commitment to being a welcoming place for students and faculty from all around the world. Most important, don't let anyone make us forget the commonalities of our shared humanity, as the president wrote. So show up, do the hard work. This is what lies before us. And in this moment, let it be said of us, we truly were the leaders and the best. So with that, I'm gonna turn to the deadline policy. <laughs> Well, that wasn't a lot of fun, but I, it was heartfelt, and I, I think it is important for us as a community to go once more into the breach and enable that research to get done that um, there are growing impediments to do. So I, I, we are in this together to help our faculty to ease their burdens. So um, with that, I'm, I'm going to turn to the deadline policy. and. And in a little bit, Kathy Handyside is going to join us, uh, but for now, she's going to sit over on the, on the sidelines and, 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 and give me uh, silent encouragement. Moral support. Moral support, yeah, yeah. Um, not the immoral support. Uh, so, um, some of this you will have heard before, and that's okay. Uh, tell them once, tell them twice, tell them again. Uh, and there's more to be learned that I won't be covering today, but um, you'll be getting mo more uh, familiar with the deadline policy today. And as David said, as a reminder to those of you that might be joining late uh, via uh, the remote broadcast, if, if you go to the streaming website on ORSP, on our ORSP's website, you can download some of the materials that we'll be referring to, the workflow particularly. So, looking forward to January 6, 2020, which is the day that the policy goes into effect. And there's a bunch of stuff that you need to know, but first and foremost is that in order for a proposal to be reviewed and submitted under the deadline policy, two conditions have to be met. The first is that the proposal must be finalized, and the second is that the path must be approved by everyone in the, in the uh, workflow before ORSP will actually review and approve the proposal. And it's not just that we, we won't do it, it's just that it will never, the path will never get to us electronically until both those conditions are met. Can you see this in the back? It's a little smaller than I had it. A thumbs up, excellent. So, what do you need to know? Uh, the level of service is based on how far in advance uh, of the sponsor's submission deadline both the PATH and the proposal arrive in ORSP. And you get two kinds of reviews depending on when that proposal arrives. 
You get a full review for if the proposal arrives at least four business days or 32 business hours in advance of the sponsor's deadline. And if you get that full review, we are going to check the proposal for compliance with the university's requirements and the sponsor's guidelines. If you get the proposal, if, uh, you, I mean, if, uh, I, it's, often it's not within your control at this point. There's other reviewers in the, in the chain that, that need to, to do their work. Uh, but if the proposal and the PATH arrive at least 15 business hours, but less than 32 business hours, you get a limited review. So before I, I go on and say what that means, why 15 business hours? So it's to give you some time. In the, in the morning, and this is what we what we we heard from the research administration community was that it was okay instead of two business days, meaning 5 p.m. on the third business day, actually 9 a.m. two business days uh, prior to the sponsor's deadline. I'll show you some ca calendar so it'll make sense to you in a moment. But if you get a limited review, it's only checking for compliance with the U of M requirements. And anything that arrives less than 15 business hours is considered at risk. It will get a limited review, but it's going to be kind of at the bottom of the, of, the, of the work queue for the project reps and OSP, and it might not get submitted. So I, I heard a colleague, I'm going to use a terrible analogy, and I'll, I'll beg your indulgence, but um, a colleague of, of mine said, a full review is like a cheeseburger happy meal. And the limited review is just like a cheeseburger. You don't get all of the extra stuff. And I said, well, it's not quite that. N it's more like the full review is the cheeseburger happy meal. The limited review is a cheeseburger that might have E. coli in it. <laughs> because we're not checking it with the sponsor's guidelines. And you're not going to know until it's too late whether or not it had E. coli. So why would you take the risk? Now, the at-risk proposal is like playing the scratch-off game at McDonald's where the grand prize is a cheeseburger that might have E. coli in it. <laughs> Meaning, you might not even get the cheeseburger. So I don't know, if, if you want to use feel free to use it. I'm not copywriting it. But th that's how to think of it. Um, try to get the full review because that is by far the safest way to go. And as I said, um, the full review, you, the proposal is checked for compliance with the U of M requirements as well as the sponsor guidelines. And the proposal will get submitted by the deadline. We're also going to review the terms and conditions to make sure that if any are binding upon award that we can actually accept those terms and conditions. And we're also going to go out there and, and say that your proposal will be successfully received by the sponsor because you're getting the cheeseburger with Happy Meal. We're checking the sponsor guidelines. The limited review, all I can tell you is that it's going to get in, and we're going to check it for our minimal institutional requirements. And at risk, all I can tell you is we're going to check it for institutional requirements, and it, that's the only commitment we can make for anything that arrives less than 15 business hours, so 9 a.m. the day before. So I, I can't, Amy, was it Amy Franklin? I can't remember. Someone on Kathy's team suggested that we, we put together a calendar just to give you some examples. So in this example, we're looking at a Friday that deadline, Friday the 18th, coming right up. In order for a proposal then to receive a full review, it needs to be submitted by 5 p.m. on Monday the 14th. So if you think about the four business days, that's Friday, Thursday, Wednesday, and Tuesday, if you'd like to count backwards. Right. Yeah? It has to be received at ORSP. Has to be received at ORSP by, by 5 p.m. Yes. Submitted. Did I say something different? Thank you. That, see, she, it's not just silent encouragement over here. She's keeping me on, on, on track. So there's your four business days. Notice we have now gone from green to orange. Same sponsor deadline, but you, your window of opportunity now is 9 a.m. Let me start at the beginning. From 
on Monday to 9 a.m. on Thursday. That will get you a limited review and perhaps food poisoning. <laughs> and then we are now going red, systems red, for an at-risk proposal. That means it has arrived in RSP 901 or later, the day before the sponsor's deadline, okay? 15 business hours. So if we were to say that the, the deadline is next Wednesday, just move everything up. The proposal then is due to be in the RSP at least by 5 p.m. on Thursday. We're not counting weekends. And I won't belabor the point, but you, you get the idea. Uh, we've got a window of opportunity which has shifted ahead a few days and similarly for the at-risk proposal. Does that make sense? Okay. So there's really three potential outcomes of a review from ORSP. The one that we love the most is everything's perfect. It's good to go. The proposal is submitted as is. And we'll walk you through the workflow for that uh, uh, outcome in, in a little bit. The second possible outcome is that the proposal is going to be returned for changes. Oh, sorry. Returned as incomplete and the finalization status is removed. So what that means is that if we get a proposal where the science should be, it says, upload the science here. That's an incomplete proposal, and we're gonna return that back to the project team as incomplete, and the clock starts over, and whenever the, the refinalized proposal comes back to RSP, it, the calculation for what level of service is applied will then be run again. So if a incomplete proposal comes in for a full review and we send it back and it comes in um, 14 business hours prior to the deadline, it's now at risk. We hope this never happens, but uh, it's possible. And the third po uh, outcome is that the proposal is going to be returned for changes. And there are two kinds of changes, those that are required and those that are recommended. And, and you may be seeing this already in the, the feedback that you're getting from project representatives who are reviewing your proposals now. So just a, a few words about required versus recommended changes. So a required change is one that the university requires in order for it to be consistent with our institutional policies and procedures. Think limited review. It's also uh, part of the full review, but um, it's, it's definitely uh, going to be applied as part of the limited review. And any required change needs to be made prior to proposal submission, hence the name required. A recommended change, though, is really about the sponsor requirements more than anything and it's part of the full review service that we provide. And these are optional. It's at the, your PI's discretion or your discretion whether or not you choose to make the recommended changes. So what does that mean though? If, um, in, in a real uh, important point here is that if your proposal does not comply with the sponsor's guidelines, let's say it's a 15 page limit and yours is 17 pages, we are going to recommend that you shorten your proposal by two pages in order to meet with the sponsor, to meet the sponsor's guidelines. It's not a required change. Okay, you may, you, so just, just know that there's gonna be really important stuff that appears in the recommended changes and it's, it's, up, it's up to, to the faculty and to the project teams to read that carefully to make sure that they're, they're doing what they think is appropriate. A few words about submission deadlines versus target dates. So this is also data fields that are now available with, on the PATH and have been since July. Um, so the submission deadline this is not the same thing as the sponsor deadline. The submission deadline is the date 
the last date by which the proposal must be submitted to meet the sponsor's deadline. So if it's an electronic submission, the submission deadline is the same as the sponsor's deadline. But if it's a hard copy that needs to, to be in Tibet by Friday, the submission deadline is, is probably gonna be a couple weeks before the sponsor's deadline. The target date is non-binding. It's a request for ORSP to, to complete its work and it's optional. Um, we'll try to honor the target date, but there are really no guarantees. The, the important point here is that the deadline policy only applies if you put in a submission date, submission deadline date, okay? Otherwise, uh, the policy doesn't apply. There are also a couple of new activities in states. Well, it's not a new activity. There's a new state called deadline missed. So the system, ERPM, will calculate when a proposal um, has missed the sponsor deadline, and if, if it does, the, the, the path will go into the state of deadline missed, and there will be an opportunity to, for 30 days to update that, that uh, deadline so that we can recalculate whether or not it uh, receives a full or limited review. And then the sp suspend approval activity is actually being modified so that it has effect. Um, prior to the, the path being arriving in ORSP, any unit approver can suspend their approval and it will stop submission. Once uh, the PATH arrives in ORSP, if anyone within the admin home chain can suspend their approval and it will prevent submission. So um, some, some actual teeth into the suspend approval uh, functionality. So I'm gonna now turn it over to Kathy who's gonna walk you through some of the workflow. So, so get, out, get out your uh, eight and a half by 14s, is that what those are? 17s? 11 by 17s, big sheets of paper, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna slide off to the side while Kathy takes over. So, as Craig mentioned, you all have one of these lovely little maps at your desk or your table, and for those of you who are joining us remotely, these are some of the materials that you can access via the viewing page. I'm putting my props underneath the little momentum here. So um, what I'm gonna walk you through is how ERPM is going to enforce all of those great things that Craig just told you. And we use workflows because that's how systems think through all of these different steps in the process. But we're gonna take this in chunks. So we're gonna go through four different scenarios. And the first one is our favorite. We call it no changes, also known as the happy path, P-A-T-H. Your path, P-A-F, takes the happy path. Um, so I don't know how familiar you all are with reading workflows, so I'm gonna walk you through this one pretty slowly and then we'll start adding in complexity so that you can kind of see how ERPM is gonna treat your proposals that are for um, paths that have a proposal with a submission date. For those that are contracts with a target date, this will not apply. So the first step, and I'm going to use the little mouse clicker here, um, when you route for approval, it'll go through unit review just like it does today, and the system will keep evaluating until all of the units have approved. So when that, for those of you who are workflow followers, anytime you have a little diamond, that's a decision point. So all units have approved, yes. So then the next thing this system is going to evaluate, has the sponsor's deadline passed? Hopefully not. Um, if it has, we'll talk about that in a minute, but no, it has not yet passed. So it goes on to decide, is the path finalized? Yes or no? In this case, yes. It's at that point you've met those two criteria that Craig talked about. It's unit approved and it's finalized. So the system will calculate the review type based on the time it arrives and the day and it will use business days to calculate that. So it will assign either full review, limited review, or at risk. And then it will move into the ORSP review cycle. Um, the first step in that cycle is the admin review. So in this case, if it's the first time through, it has not yet seen the admin review, so it will go to the admin review first. Once that is completed, it'll go to the project representative review. And then the project representative will make a decision as to whether or not changes are required. In this case, 
they say no changes, and it, they sign off, and they either log the submission to the sponsor or they send it back to you to do so. Happy path. Good? Let me, let me ask, show of hands, everybody's with me so far? Okay, in the room, everybody's raising their hands. So for those of you online, let us know if you have any questions. All right, so let's talk about what happens when there are changes. We're gonna talk about the top little flow on here. So the path gets to ORSP. The units have approved, the sponsor deadline is still not passed, it's finalized. Um, it does get a calculation of the review type. ORSP says, oh, we need to send it back to ch for changes. So they use the activity they use today, ORSP request changes, sends an email to the PI and the primary research administrator saying that you either have recommended or required changes. It comes back to you in the state of ORSP review, project team making changes. You make whatever changes you deem necessary. You complete the activity, P project team submits changes, and it goes back to ORSP. We assume that it's still finalized. We never took the finalize away. In which case, we don't have to recalculate the review type. Comes right back, ORSP admin review complete. It assumes that's already done, but the system will check to make sure that step has been completed. Goes back to the project representative for them to complete their work. Hopefully at this point, changes are no longer required. They can sign off and submit. Pretty straightforward, right? All right, we're gonna up the game one more time. So now we're gonna talk about what happens when it's deemed incomplete. So I'm gonna take us to um, the step down here where it says, is the path finalized? This is the first time through. We calculate the review type, ORSP does their review, and they determine that it is incomplete. You're missing some component that's required. They will use the same activity, ORSP request changes, but when they do that, they will indicate that it's incomplete. And it will be sent back to you. It'll go to the state of ORSP review, project team making changes, but you will receive a different email, one that tells you that it's been marked incomplete. And that action will also remove the finalized flag, so it's no longer finalized, and will also remove the review type. Once you submit your changes and you've completed the proposal, you will finalize again and the system will check to see is it finalized? I'm gonna take you back through here. It will recalculate the review type and it'll move it back to the project representative. So if you take a couple days to do this, you might have made a full review that was originally submitted and deemed incomplete might now be at limited or at risk. So that does get recalculated. Um, if you don't finalize that second time, when it comes back in, when you submit changes, the system will evaluate if you are final, and if not, it will go to the state called awaiting final proposal. And it will sit there until you finalize. Okay? So then there's one last one. Do you have, I, okay. All right, I have three minutes, I can do this. <laughs> So the last one is what happens when the deadline passes? And in this case, you can see this might happen if you submit something and the deadline's already passed or if it's been sent back to you, it's incomplete. When we recalculate it and we identify that the path, ha the deadline has passed or if it sits in awaiting final proposal and never gets finalized, the system will evaluate if the deadline has passed and if so, it will move it to this new state called sponsor deadline missed. In that state, you'll have a new activity that you can use to move the sponsor deadline out. Let's say you got special permission from your program officer that you could have an extension. I don't know how often that comes up. Maybe there's something else that your PI was able to negotiate. You will have this activity. It will allow you to extend the deadline by up to 30 days. You don't need to get new signatures in that 30-day period. That activity will up the sponsor deadline and it will either move it back into a waiting final proposal, meaning that you still have a little more time to finalize, or if you final, if you're already finalized and unit reviewed, when you complete that activity, it'll move it to ORSP for review. So the system's basically doing all of the things to enforce what Craig went over with you earlier. 
Um, if the project sits in the sponsor deadline missed, that state for more than 30 days, on the 30th day, we will move it to canceled. We'll assume that it's no longer valid, and you can always go in and clone it if you want to try it for another proposal cycle. Okay? So there will be a lot more information to come on the workflow, the system activities, as well as the deadline policy itself. We're planning to have a few interchanges think town halls across campus where you can come and learn more information. We're also planning to take a video recording of that interchange, so we'll make that available to those of you who want to see it who aren't able to come in person. Um, we're also talking to the schools and colleges about coming to their various forums, research administration networks internally, and we'll have lots of electronic reminders about this coming soon, as well as job aids for the new activities and new policies, both in the system as well as the policies. So, my thanks to Craig. Deadline policy coming soon, January 6th. Be prepared. All right, so now we are going to move on to Test your knowledge of what you just heard. So question one should basically be, do you want a Happy Meal or do you want E. coli? <laughs> OK. Everyone on your table should have an eye clicker. It looks a little bit like a TV remote. Cindy is holding it up to show, to demonstrate. Those of you who are watching remotely, this is the advantage to, of coming in person to the RAND meeting. Fabulous prizes in store. All right, does everyone have an eye clicker? Does anyone not have an eye clicker? If you don't have an eye clicker, you're going to have to glom on with another table, so just say yes, you do. Everyone has one. All right, everyone, turn on your eye clicker. Make sure that you press the power button and you see a little green light. If you don't see a green light, you are not participating. And we just replaced the batteries. Cindy did, so thank you, Cindy. Everyone have power. Anyone not have power? All right. Are you ready? Okay, so everyone, has everyone used an eye clicker before? If not, this is your, your uh, trial by fire. It's pretty easy. All right, here's your first question. The ORSP project representative, PR, assigned to your department plans to return your PI's path after giving the proposal a full review because the budget includes a request to fund a piece of equipment and equipment is expressly disallowed in the sponsor's guidelines. The PR will therefore A, return the path with required changes, B, return the path with recommended changes, C, return the path as incomplete, D, return the path as incomprehensible, or E, return the path to Meyer for a 10 cent refund. <laughs> Five cents in New Hampshire, Massachusetts, and Vermont. Do you want me to show it? Oh. And just so you know, Chris is the puppet master. Um, do we know how many tables we have? All right. Last chance. Ring in if you haven't. Oh, we're up to 20. Oh, there we go. All right. I think we have 21 tables. Does that sound right? And the vast majority say return the path with recommended changes. And the correct answer is B. Yay! You're all winners. OK. Are we ready for our next question? Question number two. 
Your PI's proposal is due today but is at risk. E. coli. Because the PATH and finalized proposal arrived in ORSP 14 business hours prior to the submission deadline, which of the following proposals will be pr prioritized over your PI's? A, a proposal that qualified for a full review and is due tomorrow. B, a proposal that qualified for a full review and is due 21 days from today. C, a proposal that qualified for a limited review and is due today. D, a proposal that qualified for a limited review and is due tomorrow. Or E, all of the above. This is like a CRA exam question, so those of you who have taken the CRA. Okay, we have a couple more tables. Try to wrap up your discussion and come up with your final answer, whoever you are. Oh, okay, one last table. I'll give you to 145. Four, three, two, one. Sorry. Oh, nice job, table 21. And. The vast majority say E, all of the above. Are you correct? You are correct, yay! Now let's publicly shame the one table that got it wrong. I don't know who you are. Did we, who did, what did that, that table chose? C, a proposal that qualified for, was that correct? Is that what they chose? Anyone remember? Okay. Speak to Craig later if you want more information on why C is not the correct answer. All right, next question. Question three, which of the following won't prevent ORSP from reviewing a proposal to NSF? A, ORSP doesn't have access in Fastlane or research.gov to submit. B, the PATH is missing the Dean's Office approval. C, the proposal hasn't been finalized. D, Craig is sleeping under his desk again. It's not D. That just sort of goes without saying. Okay, just a few more seconds. Finalize your answers. We have three tables still outstanding. Come on, let's have a full cadre of tables showing up. 
Two more. You can do it. Uh, so close. All right, let's see. The correct answer, whoa. Hmm. Interesting. Nobody chose B, and yet somebody chose E. Hmm. I don't, well, Craig, we might have to have you speak to this one. The correct answer, are you ready? Correct answer is D. Craig is sleeping under his desk again. Do you want to speak to it? So everything else will not prevent, will prevent, sorry, prevent ORSP from submitting to NSF. We all good? All right. All right, question four. You can redeem yourselves. You are routing a path for a contract to be negotiated by ORSP, and the path arrives in ORSP a full day after the target date that was entered on the path. The submission deadline field was left blank. Which of the following is true? A, the path and proposal will enter the state of submission deadline missed. B, the, the new internal deadline policy does not apply. C, the path and proposal will be considered at risk. D, the path will be returned for a required change so that the target date can be updated. E, the ORSP PR will fall out of her chair in astonishment that a path didn't arrive on time, because it just never happens. Remember, you can refer to your giant sheets of paper. All right, we have a few more tables to ring in. Try to reach your conclusion. Two more. We can do it. So, oh, to, oh Chris, show us the answer. All right, the vast majority say B, but we've got a few people that say D. And the correct answer is B, the new internal deadline policy does not apply. Do we all understand why? Constance, tell us why. Could you say that again, loud and proud? So for those of you who are viewing remotely, the reason is because Craig just told us that if you don't enter a date in the submit, submission deadline field, the, submission, the deadline policy does not apply. 
But don't use that to game the system. Thank you, Scott. All right. Question five. Which of the following scenarios results in the path and proposal being checked only for compliance with U of M's requirements and therefore runs the risk of not complying with the sponsor's guidelines or of resulting in an award that U of M cannot accept? A, your proposal qualifies for a full review. B, your proposal qualifies for a limited review. C, your proposal is at risk. D, answers A and B and E answers B and C. All right, just a few more seconds, everyone. Try to wrap up your discussions and reach your final conclusions. We have a few tables still outstanding. You can do it. All right, Chris, show us the responses, please. Vast majority say E, answers B and C. And the correct answer is E, answers B and C. Yay! And remember, if you ha are, that means if you are a um, limited review or at risk, basically, it's the E. e coli option. So, all right. Question six. Which of the following is not included in the ORSP full review? A, font size and spacing. B, other U of M commitments appropriately recognized and documented and, corresp and correspond to proposal. C, f and cost rate does not exceed rate allowed by sponsor. Or D, page length limits observed. Which one is not included in the ORSP full review? Okay, A, which of the following is not included in the ORSP full review? Which everyone should have, they have a handout on their table, right, of the uh, review checklist? Okay, which of the following is not included in the ORSP full review? A, font size and spacing. B, other U of M commitments appropriately recognized and documented and correspond to the proposal. C, f and cost rate does not exceed rate allowed by sponsor, or D, page length limits observed. Just a few more seconds.
This was a stumper, apparently. All right, Chris. All right, it's a little bit of a split, but the majority say A, font size and spacing. And the correct answer is A, font size and spacing. All right. Our last question, which of the following universities also have enforced deadline policies? A, Stanford University, B, Washington University, C, Harvard University, D, what's the matter university, or E, all of the above? What's the matter, you? What's that? All right, we have a couple people quick ringing, and Chris is showing us the responses and the which interesting really interesting who said D <laughs> all right the correct answer is all of the above so we are joining fine company what's the matter you What's the matter, you? All right, we're at the break. It is now 3.11. What time are we coming back? 3.15, break fast. Yeah. OK, we'll come back at 3.20.
Just one more minute, folks. Go ahead and grab coffee or water or whatever and wrap up your conversations, then we'll come back in just one minute. Okay, if everyone can find your seats, come back together as a group, we will start back up again. All right, quick microphone switch out, and we're good to go. Scary things versus not scary things, um, and change coming to the university and to the research administration community. I thought I would share with you something scary that we ran across. Um, this was actually a couple years ago now that we did a, um, some audience analysis reports for the Navigate program, and we discovered that we have 259 different job codes that are being used for folks in various research administration responsibilities throughout the university. That's scary. So by comparison, what's not scary? Implementing a new research administration job code series. So, um, there we go. Um, we have, um, Heather Sutfin and Steve Drews from Central uh, University HR coming in just a couple minutes to tell us more about that. But first we have some updates from Debbie Talley. Oh, is this me for real? Oh, sorry Debbie, this is me. Um, sorry, Navigate updates are first. So uh, for those of you who, um, should have seen a rapid announcement about the Lunch and Learn series. Um, we have two uh, Lunch and Learn sponsor specific sessions that are happening. We just actually had one yesterday um, that was NSF focused, National Science Foundation focused. That, uh, we have a recording of that will be going up shortly. So if you're looking for that, the, uh, the recording should be up within the next uh, few days. Um, but also coming up on October 30th, we have a, a second session focusing on the NIH. Um, we have a uniform guidance cost principles class that will happen on November 7th. Um, the deadline to register for that is October 25th, so be sure to get in your registrations on that. That will happen at Wolverine Tower. And then also you should have gotten a rapid for a couple of essentials e-learning modules that have gone out. Um, we have one for covering cost transfers and one uh, on award modifications, so those are just two in a continuing series of e-learning modules. For additional information, as always, you can go to orsp.umich.edu slash navigate, or you can email us at navigate-research at umich.edu. All right, then some additional professional societies updates. Um, Encura. Encura has some traveling workshops that are happening in December, December 4th through 6th in New Orleans, which would be a nice place to go in December. Um, that workshop will be covering contract negotiation and administration, departmental research administration, uh, financial research administration, and then they have the level one fundamentals of sponsored project administration and the level two sponsored projects administration happening there. Um, in addition, the financial research administration and pre Pre-award research administration conferences will be happening in March in San Juan, Puerto Rico. Um, registration is open now and uh, program and room block information will be coming in November of this year. 
And then finally, uh, for, for Encura, um, Encura Region 3 slash 4, the combined spring meeting will be happening in April, April 26th through 29th of next year in St. Pete Beach, Florida. Uh, Pre-conference workshops begin on April 25th and the registration and program information are coming soon. Oh, I lied, one more for Encura. The annual meeting is happening August 9th through 12th of 2020, as always in Washington, D.C., and more information on that will be coming at future RAN meetings. Then SRA, the Society of Research Administrators International, the SRA Internet, uh, annual meeting is happening October 19th through 23rd in San Francisco. Um, hopefully you have already registered because it's coming up really fast. Um, the theme is leading change, inspiring excellence, and uh, on-site registration is available. Then, uh, happy to announce that the Michigan chapter meeting of SRA will be happening June 2020 in Kalamazoo, Michigan on the campus of Western Michigan University. So more information will be coming on that at an upcoming RAND meeting, so stay tuned. Uh, in addition, the National Organization of Research Development Professionals, or NORDUP, uh, their uh, 2020 meeting will be happening May 17th through uh, the 20th in San Antonio, Texas. The call for abstracts is open and the deadline is October 21st, 2019. Also, just wanted to put a plug in the NORDUP um, Great Lakes Regional Meeting is actually happening on Monday here at the University of Michigan. Uh, today is the last day to register for that. It's an, uh, a one-day event. I believe the uh, registration fee is $60. Um, there should have been a communication that's gone out uh, via RAPID at some time in the recent past, so you can um, still get, get in on that for Monday's event. All right, now we can talk about Debbie. So I, I was on the fence on this one because I, I didn't know, okay, is this scary, is this not scary? So Sponsored Programs has over 2,300 reports due to produce before the end of calendar year 2019, which is, you know, there's obviously a lot, of, a lot of reports. It's sort of daunting. But then we, the, the, the Sponsored Programs accountants are so anal retentive that on the giant novelty thermometer outside of Debbie's office. They couldn't just put 2,300. They actually had to put the 2,301 reports. So obviously they're paying attention to details. So that's a good thing. All right, Debbie, sponsored programs updates. Hi, everyone. Okay, a couple um, updates. Um, one of them is related to the purchase discounts. Um, just to let you guys know where we are with that, um, there are no additional changes that are going to be made to the process. So I spoke, I think it was back in May, about what we had planned. Um, so all of the discounts are passed on on all sponsored projects. Um, there was an update made, um, a system update made um, to make sure that the charge and the discount happen in the same month. So hopefully if that was confusing to anyone, that um, adjustment has been made. Um, if you have questions about the process um, or are just really confused about it, hopefully you've taken a look at the website that's listed here for the frequently asked questions. Um, and then the last thing is just, um, just to let you guys know about our journal entry process. So as I'm sure um, you may be challenged with doing, preparing these journals, um, which are cost transfers, um, there is a long process in actually reviewing them. So there were, have been about 400 journals done on this um, activity since we um, implemented the change. And it's rather time consuming for um, the staff and customer service, which I'm sure it's time consuming for all of you. So just to plug in there about making sure that we charge things to the right place um, um, when we are making the purchase so we don't have those journal entries to process. Next thing, um, you already heard about the number of reports we have here. Um, so yes, we are a bunch of accountants in sponsored programs and um, we do have, or did have, 2,301 reports to um, complete by December 24th. Um, we now have about 800 of those done. So I just want to say thank you to all of you. 
<clears throat> this is a huge effort for us. It's our busiest time of the year. And um, as I think most of you all know, we have a number of new staff. Um, and because of that, we've really um, had our whole office involved in this, whether it be training our new staff, um, answering lots of questions, reviewing reports, actually producing some of the reports. So some of the customer service people here today are actually preparing reports as well. Um, but I do really want to say thank you for um, helping us to meet these deadlines. Um, it's really important that it, once you get a report that you follow the timeline that's in there. Um, I know you're probably all wondering why if I get it now and it's not due until October 31st, I have all this time. I don't know why you need it back right away. Well, we had this month about 500 reports due by August 31st, or I'm sorry, October 31st. If we got them all back on that day, there would be no way we could get them all submitted on time. So please return them as soon as you can. Um, we're, we're trying to get at least 100 reports produced and out to the sponsors every week to meet those deadlines. So thank you again for all of your hard work in getting, um, helping us achieve that goal. And the last thing I wanted to talk about are our new staff and some updates related to staff. So we have um, five new people who started on, uh, let's see, September 16th. Um, and if you're not familiar with um, how we hire and sponsor programs, generally we hire people starting um, the first part of January and again in May. It's unusual for us to hire in the fall, um, mostly because of this huge deadline um, with all the reports that we need to get done. But because we had so many openings, we um, have a new uh, group of staff who started, uh, Mohammed, Mike, uh, Andrew, Karen, and Dawn, and I don't think any of them are here, is that right? Right, okay, they are all back there doing reports because they got their list on Friday. Um, and then in addition to that, we um, had a promotion. Alora was promoted um, effective October 1st um, to senior reporting accountant. And um, for this time of the year, that means she gets lots more reports than normal. And then um, lastly, um, Jake Schlag uh, joined us back um, in July. Um, Jake had been in sponsored programs a number of years ago and we're fortunate to have him back and we promoted him to a supervisor. Um, in addition to the other reporting supervisors that we have. So because we have so many new staff, um, we really had a need to add an additional supervisor to the reporting area. So we're very fortunate to have Jake um, with a lot of um, knowledge and sponsored programs to take that role. So that is my updates. And now I get to turn it over to Steve Drews and Heather Supton, who are from HR Comp and Class. And they're going to talk about um, the new RA um, uh, series, I guess I should call it. Good afternoon. My name is Heather Sutphin, and I am one of the team members who worked on this project, and we are so excited that it's going to be launching here real soon. So we worked on it for a year, so anyway. So why did we choose to work on research administration? Quite simply, research is valued and important at the university. We also noticed that from 2008, which is the last time that this series was looked at, um, the series had a predominance towards post-award work and pre-award work. And as we learned, as we moved on, that it seems like everybody does a mixture of both. We also learned that there was um, inconsistency with use of the titles out there, which then in turn to confusion among individuals of what is a promotion, what is not a promotion. Um, and somebody's doing the same work over in this unit, I'm doing the same work, we're different titles. So there was just a lot of confusion out there. So how did we do this endeavor? and it was a large endeavor. Uh, we comprised individuals on our team from our large schools and colleges, LSNA, College of Engineering. We had representatives from our small schools. We had central um, 
participants as well, finance, HR, sponsored programs. We also had executive sponsors, Deb Talley, Craig Reynolds as well. So what? What were we working on? We, were, we took a look at the current series, and as you can see, the grants and contracts and the contract and grant specialists, there was just a lot of confusion out there as to what was what. And unless you were here from 2008, the last time that a matrix was developed for this series, you really didn't know uh, which was what. So what, here is the redesigned series um, that we all came up with. And you'll notice that we've included an assistant level and we did that because we realized that there were a lot of administrative support that were dedicated to this series. And much like your legal assistants, marketing assistants, HR assistants, we felt that this series should also have an assistant track, which would also give those individuals a career path should, should they choose this series to work in their um, field. We also came up with the conclusion that regardless of where you sit in the university, research administration work is the same. We also, in the team, everyone has committed to mapping people accordingly to the matrix so that an intermediate at one unit is equal to an intermediate at another unit. Therefore, therefore ensuring that everything is going to be um, leveled out so we're pretty excited by that. And we're also excited because members of the team have committed to holding each other accountable as well. So that was, that was a lot. And also you'll see in this redesign series that this is clearly going to allow people to understand what is and is not a promotion. And it's also going to help hiring managers because that was another thing that we heard through the team was, I'm afraid to lose my person. I don't know where I'm going to find someone else. So this is going to help hiring managers understand where they can get talent for their next level as well as for employees. So if you're in a unit that maybe doesn't have the lead level and you want to become a lead, you can look across the university now and see where leads sit for a potential next movement. So when is this going to occur? I'm, we're, I'm getting excited because we've worked on this now for about a year. And we're going to implement this in January 1st, 2020. So right now, uh, last week, we sent out mappings to all of your units. And they should be working on them now, but it's going to be implemented January 1st. We're also excited to um, let you know that if anybody moves exemptions, I feel this is important. Um, because it's a university-wide effort, nobody is going to lose accruals. Um, so that was something exciting as well. And that's about, that's about it in a really quick high level. I think we have a couple minutes. Does anybody have questions, concerns? I know that Steve and I have gone out to a few units and talked, so I apologize that some of you have heard this twice already. No? Yes? Yes, some units, yes, yep, I'll ask. Um, we had a question out here that was, what does that mean, um, unit discretion for completing job descriptions? Some units took this opportunity to redo job descriptions for each of the series. Let me see if I can go back. Um, they're taking this opportunity to update all the job descriptions. Other units, they just, for whatever reason, they don't have the time. It's not in their timeline. So that's what that means. Yes. Yes. It was starting to happen in September. Um, I know of the one unit, they were starting that process in September, and they were hopeful to get it done. I don't think they did yet. I think they're still working on it. Um, that's only one unit that I know of. I haven't heard of any others that are going that far yet. Yes. Yes. 
Yes, the question was, how is this going to be communicated? So our communication effort, um, as I stated, is Steve and I have gone out to some units already and started talking. Um, we're also talking to you today now. And then locally, at the local unit level, um, they should be having starting their discussions with you if they haven't already started. And then once everybody is mapped, um, again, they should have discussions with individuals to let them know where they map to. I thought I saw another hand. Yes. Yep. The question was, does this apply to all schools and is salary changing? So the first part of that answer is yes. This is university-wide, and we have commitment from everybody, including Dearborn, Flint, all of our schools and colleges, that this is going to be utilized, as well as commitment that people are going to be mapped accordingly. Second question around compensation. As we all know, units have, we are in a decentralized environment, and what that means is each unit sets up compensation that works best for them, and some have you know, fiscal responsibilities, scope, experience. So generally speaking, no compensation is going to change that I know of. I know that some units said after everybody is mapped and we see how everybody looks university-wide, they might go back and look. But I think the important thing is that nobody's job is changing. We're just reclassifying the title and we're also giving you more of a clear career path. Yes. So the question was, where can one find the descriptions for the new positions? Um, very soon, we're going to publish the competency matrix out on a website. Right now, we're just having a little bit of internal discussion of where do we want to put that. Um, but that will be available very soon. All of your unit HR should have that. Um, so they should be able to share it with you. So the question was, of all these jobs, they wanted to know what is the distribution of bi-weekly and monthly, otherwise exempt and non-exempt, correct? So our non-exempt jobs are the research administration assistant, research administration associate. Intermediate, all through, are exempt. I'm sorry? You don't understand the pick? Okay, yep. So this picture is de um, depicting like an individual contributor path and then a managerial path. So here at the university, um, on the managerial path, you manage three or more people, individual contributors. You can be a very high level, value just as important. Um, in fact, we have some people who are leads and they do have a couple people underneath them. So that's what that is. Yes. Yes, the question was, do each of these jobs have number of years? So unique on this matrix, we built this matrix to be very flexible to the units. So when you see the matrix, you're going to see right on the side typical years of experience because we wanted to recognize that there are some people who are, quite frankly, rock stars, right? And they could become a senior level in a matter of five years, whereas it might take somebody else um, 10 years to get there. But yes, on the matrix, we did put in their typical years, but it's not a hard, fast rule. Yes. This one? So right now on January 1st, um, we 
concentrated on these titles, but we also recognize that there are a lot of people who are sitting in administrative specialist, financial specialist, and those people who are doing um, a majority of research administration should be mapped to this series. So if you aren't doing research administration related work a majority of your time, and you are a financial specialist, then you would probably stay in that financial specialist. But if you're doing a majority of your work research administration, you should be mapped to here. And we also had that commitment across in our team of saying yes, if somebody is an administrative specialist, financial specialist, um, I can't remember, there were a couple other ones as well, that, but they were going to move them to this series. And this will also help, too, with training for Dave. He'll be able to look and say, hey, I have a group of intermediates. This is the typical training, right, to target for them. So it really is a benefit to be put into the research administration series. Yes? This one? Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Yes? Yes. The no, and then it should be. Um, and I should point out that these titles will be inactivated um, pretty soon. Okay. Well, thank you. If you have any questions, comments, or anything, um, you didn't feel comfortable asking it in the group, please give me a call, email me. Um, we're here to help you. Um, we're here to help you as much as we can. So, I'm going to, I think it's Becky, right? Yes, yes Becky. Okay, so we are wrapping up our meeting. Um, I wanted to remind you all that we will have the slides and the video up on the ORSP website. And um, we also wanted to note that the questions that were part of the, the quiz show that David hosted, those are going to be on the ORSP website as well with the FAQ, as FAQs in that section. So if you wanted to dig into that a little bit more or share those, feel free. Um, and we, our next meeting will be uh, Tuesday, February 25th, so come on back and see us when it's nice and chilly outside. And um, we will be sending out a survey seeking some information about topics for future meetings, so uh, take a look out for those. Thank you very much. Have a good rest of your day.